There's a moment right at the end of the 1989 AIDS movie, Longtime Companion, when the three main characters of that film, Fuzzy, Willie, and Lisa, are walking along a beach together, fantasizing about what the end of HIV might look like. And Fuzzy says, what do you think it'll be like? What do you think the end will be like? And Lisa says, it'll be like the end of World War II. And as the three of them look up into the distance, they see all of their friends who have died of HIV coming through the sand dunes, doing a dance together in one last reunion, in hugs and tears. This Hollywood fantasy perpetuates the notion that there will be an end of HIV moment, a singular moment. And I'm actually going to argue that there is no moment, rather a process of emerging moments that will lead to the end of HIV. And I think we are in one of those moments right now. I think that we are in a moment that is so exciting so exhilarating and so thrilling, we should be out on the streets right now dancing. Why is that? Well, we know that those very same HIV drugs that can keep people with HIV alive and well can now be used by those of us who don't have HIV to prevent us from getting it if we take those drugs before we have sex. This is called pre-exposure HIV prophylaxis, or PrEP. And I have spent the last three years researching the acceptability of PrEP in men who have sex with men in London. Now, research shows us that if you take a single daily dose of a drug called Trivada, it's a drug that's used as HIV treatments for people with HIV, then you can reduce your HIV acquisition by almost a half. But what we actually know is that if you take those drugs consistently and carefully, you can reduce your HIV risk to almost zero. In fact, in a brand new piece of research released from San Francisco just two weeks ago, of 600 people who were taking a daily dose of oral PrEP who were followed up over a 32-month period, not one of them got HIV. There was not one single HIV infection in people who were using a single, simple pill called Travada. Now, if Travada is so effective, why aren't more people using it? In the United States of America, where Travada was licensed just three years ago, uptake has been fairly low. But why are not more people using it? Well, one of the huge, big barriers to, to Travada use is cost. Now, it doesn't just apply to the United States of America. It applies to most parts of the world, where most of us can't get hold of PrEP unless we're on a clinical trial or unless we can buy a private prescription. And just moments from where we are today, any of us could go and buy a private prescription for PrEP if we have a spare £5,000 in our back pockets. How many of us have that kind of money to spare? But actually, what an increasing number of us do have in our back pocket is this. This is generic Travada that increasing numbers of us are buying online and importing from places like India. And in a throwback to the buyers' clubs of the 80s and 90s, an increasing number of us are now purchasing our drugs ourselves without any medical support. So for the cost of less than two pints of beer a week, I'm importing my own Travada, and this is what's stopping me from getting HIV. And more and more of us are going to start doing this unless the people who are responsible for making decisions in our public health systems either give us Travada for free or drastically reduce the costs of Travada. Now, some of you here today might be thinking, yeah, I could benefit from taking a drug like this, but I don't take risks very often. I don't have sex very much or actually I can't afford to buy a pill every day. And actually, there's some new fantastic research that's also around PrEP 
that we should be thinking about. Because we now know that if you take two of these drugs the day before you have sex, and then 24 hours, and then 24 hours after that, this kind of dosing is as effective as taking this drug every single day. So if we pre-plan our sex in this way, if we're going to Berlin for a dirty weekend, <laughs> or if we have a special friend coming to town, or if we're hoping, I don't know, to hook up at a TED event, <laughs> then this kind of event-based dosing might be very good. But actually, how many of us plan our sex in that way? Who here today knows for sure that they're going to have sex tomorrow? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> But actually, what we're finding is that very few people pre-plan their sex. Very few people have spontaneous sex. And, we, and with the advent of smartphones and GPS-based apps, most of us can find sex and other people who want to have sex in almost any part of the world at any part of the time. So these kind of pills aren't always going to be useful for all of us for the ways we plan sex. But... Let's leave pills aside for a second, because I want to talk about one of the other new and important developments in PrEP research. And I want to talk about what some of you might know as microbicides or topical PrEP. And this, is, this follows the same concept of using PrEP inside a gel or a foam format that is inserted inside the body prior to sex. And there have been some fantastic international research studies done with women where a gel format has been taken and put into an applicator and then applied into the vagina within 12 hours prior to sex and then 12 hours afterwards. And those trials are showing the same kind of results, that we can reduce HIV acquisition if we use what's called a vaginal microbicide. But let's think for a minute about whether we might also use those same kind of gels in men who have sex with men or with women who enjoy anal intercourse. Would we be prepared to use an applicator like this, full of gel, and insert it into ourselves? Well, at this stage, I was actually going to ask if there was a man in the audience who's prepared to come up and join us on the stage so we can explore this further. But instead, I'm going to invite my friend Jim to come and be part of the presentation so that we can understand some of the issues around acceptability and rectal microbicides. Jim, are you ready to join us? <laughs> so unfortunately, Jim has a little bit deflated. <laughs> Oops. And so I've been doing research that helps us to understand with men who have sex with men how acceptable it would be to insert a rectal gel. And what these men have started to tell me is about the processes that they already use as they prepare for anal intercourse. And Jim and I spent some time together this morning when he showed me some of the preparation he does. And here he is doing what most of us do before we have anal sex. We like to evacuate. And actually what most of us also like to do is to go through a process of cleansing. And here is Jim, just earlier today, with his bulb douche swilling some lukewarm water around his rectum so that whoever here is going to have sex with him later on today can have a nice, clean episode. But actually, when we start talking about the acceptability of rectal microbicides with men who have sex with men, men start to ask some fundamental questions about how acceptable these microbicides might be. And these kind of questions focus on, how am I going to get the gel like this into my body? How am I going to use an applicator? Is it going to hurt? Is the gel going to be too cold? And here's Jim just a couple of hours ago trying that out. But one of the other questions is how am I going to do it and am I going to have to get a friend to help me to get this inside? Or how am I going to get the gel inside me to where ejaculate might reach? How am I going to get into that right position? And maybe, you know, you can predict some of the positions we might think about getting in. And, you know, Jim had the opportunity of trying this out at home before he came in today. But imagine if you had to do this in a place like the school or the library or any other workplace. But you might have already started thinking about one of the other issues about inserting a gel up inside you if you have to pre-plan that before your sex. And... 
Jim likes to cycle like many people. And you've probably started to think about, well, if I like to cycle, what's going to happen as I start moving around to that gel? And here's one of the key issues that men talk about around rectal microbicide acceptability. Leakage and spillage. And actually, as Jim prepared for the session today and he cycled in, here is one of the fundamental problems of applying a gel in advance. And that's not just <laughs> about some of the social problems. Can you imagine going on a hot date and having anal leakage going all over your chair? But it also has an impact on prep efficacy. If the gel is leaking out of me, is it going to be protective? And one of the other problems that men talk about is what we just looked at in the slides today. Jim, like many other people, gets nervous before he goes on a hot date. And what happens when we get nervous? Well, sometimes that whole cycle of expulsion happens again. And what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to have to go through that whole cleansing process again? And if I do, is that going to take the gel out of me? Or am I going to have to stop and apply more gel? And could I overdose? So these are all some of the problems about the acceptability of using a format of rectal microbicides that need us to use an applicator or need us to pre-apply. And these are highly unacceptable for most men who have sex with men. But actually, there's some really good news to come out of this, because if we can find methods of rectal microbicides that can be used with the sex that we currently have, the ways of having sex, or within the re regimes we use to pre-prepare for sex, then rectal microbicides suddenly become highly, highly acceptable. So how could we develop microbicides that are incorporated in the kind of lubricant we use for rectal intercourse? And in one of the most exciting developments in rectal microbicide research in probably a decade, John Hopkins Institute are about to start research on the efficacy of using a rectal microbicide that's inside a douche. So a douche that could be protective as part of the process of our preparation for anal intercourse. So will PrEP lead to the end of HIV? Well, if we want PrEP to contribute to the end of HIV, we need to move beyond thinking of PrEP as something that is only going to impact on individuals. We have to consider how it can have a public health impact. And if PrEP is going to have a public health impact, it needs our health policy makers to step up the game about making PrEP available to a greater number of people, either for free or at a cheaper cost. And we need those same health policymakers to make sure that PrEP and the support services that go around it are available to those of us who are most vulnerable to HIV. That includes men who have sex with men, black African women, young queer people, transgender people, people who sell sex, young black gay men, and people who inject drugs. And these are all of the people who currently face the greatest health inequalities, particularly around HIV and particularly around sexual health. But today I've only talked about pills and gels, but actually there are a whole load of PrEP development pipeline factors that are coming in. PrEP development that we can actually incorporate in the way we have sex and in our planning for sex. And these include injectable PrEP, long-acting PrEP, fizzy dissolvable tablets that we could apply either rectally or vaginally, little strips of film, and rectal douches. And I wonder if, when we consider when Longtime Companion was made, if we could ever envisage that 25 years later we would have a whole set of PrEP technologies that not only protected us from HIV, but also didn't diminish the pleasure, the joy, the intimacy and the connection we have during sex. So I wonder if actually there's a different ending to the long-term companion. Because there's a part at the end of the 1989 AIDS movie, Long Time Companion, when the three characters who focus in the film, Fuzzy, Willie and Lisa are walking along a beach together and Fuzzy says, what do you think it will be like at the end? And Lisa stops for a moment and she looks around and she opens her purse and she pulls out a bottle of Travada and she says, maybe the end will look like this. And then she looks around again and says, do you know what? Maybe the end will be a douchebag.
Thank you. Thank you.